This is Anna. And this is Elsa. You know them from Frozen. You know this outfit. And this one. But are they accurate? We got this fashion historian. Hi, I'm Raisa Britannia, and I'm a fashion historian. She's going to walk us through what Disney got right and what they got wrong about these dresses. First, let's establish a time period. Frozen is set in 1840s Norway. That's specific. We know it's Norway because there are fjords. Anything else? The town of Arendal is named after the Norwegian town Arendal. So why the 1840s? In the short Frozen Fever, we see a map. On the top left corner, you see Roman numerals that say 1840. Frozen is based on the story The Snow Queen, which was written in 1844. Let's start with Elsa's iconic Ice Queen look. So this dress is total fantasy, so could we just rewind a bit? Okay, here's her coronation gown. For most of the 19th century, Norway and Sweden were united. And we actually know who the queen was, and that was Josephine of Leochtenbarg. And her coronation ceremony was 1844. So what's inaccurate about Elsa's coronation look? Right off the bat, I noticed that the silhouette is way too narrow, because at this time period, skirts were pretty full. And I'm not really sure what's happening with those sleeves, but long sleeves wouldn't be worn at night. So this is not accurate. Let's draw Elsa's coronation gown from the undergarments up. First up, the underwear. So the first thing she'd be wearing would be a chemise, and underneath she would also be wearing drawers. The 1840s saw the popularization of split crotch drawers. These are two separate pieces of fabric. These reached below the knee and were secured by a ribbon. This is the beginning of what we think of as modern underwear. The next layer? A woman would wear stockings called strumpa in Norway. What we have here is an original design for a stocking, and you can really see that there are these floral motifs crawling up the leg. Next up, the corset. Corsets were essential for hundreds of years, but in the 19th century, they were distinctly hourglass shaped. The 1840s saw the beginning of a practice called tight lacing, which involved tying your corset really tight. The goal was meant to have the smallest waistline possible, even if it meant not breathing. Here is where the silhouette starts to diverge from the Disney Elsa. And then come the petticoats. See this dome shape here? It's created by layers and layers and layers of petticoats. These petticoats were very heavy, upwards of 20 pounds. The bottom petticoat would likely be made of something called horsehair, which was really stiff and helped to really stick out the silhouette. Quilted petticoats would be worn on top of that to help really smooth out that silhouette. The outermost petticoat was typically white, made of a cotton or linen, and this would be your nicest petticoat. On top of all of that, the ceremonial gown. Because we're talking about Elsa's coronation day, we're going to look at a very specific type of dress called a court gown. This here is the actual court gown that Josephine wore for her coronation in 1844. You can see quite a few differences. First of all, the color. In most depictions of European monarchs, you see them wearing white coronation garb. And that's really because this is a religious ceremony, and so the white and the gold really creates this symbolism of purity and divinity. These dresses were in three parts, the bodice, the skirt, and the train, which was often detachable. You can see that Elsa's wearing long sleeves, and that is definitely wrong for this kind of dress. Here you see an example of an 1840s day dress. It really should be a short, flouncy sleeve. And adding onto the train would be the cape. So this is actually Josephine's coronation cape. They actually did a pretty good job with Elsa's coronation cape because as you can see, it is pretty long. Also that magenta color is pretty wrong, but I'll get into that later. And now her shoes. So these shoes would have been called straights, which meant there was no right and left, and we wouldn't see specific right and left shoes until the later half of the 19th century. Evening shoes were typically made of silk and mostly worn indoors. Moving on to the hair and crown. European hairstyles were greatly influenced by Queen Victoria, the Queen of Britain. So this hairstyle was often featured in fashion plates alongside other fashionable hairstyles from the period, one of which was this style called spaniel curls, and they were these curls that kind of came and framed the face. It appears that Queen Josephine is wearing her hair in this style here. 
The only thing really accurate about Elsa's hair is that she is wearing an updo, which is appropriate for evening. So I'm trying to figure out what kind of crown Queen Josephine would have worn. If we look at this 1858 portrait, we see that she's wearing a diamond tiara. And this is the one that became more closely associated with her. So here's what Elsa would have looked like compared to the original Disney look. Let's move on to Anna. Anna purchases this outfit from Wandering Oaken's trading post. This is on the way out to the countryside. So was this accurate for the 19th century Norwegian countryside? The animators really took care to include elements from traditional Norwegian folk clothing. There's a specific Norwegian folk costume called the bunad. You may have seen pictures like this or this, and that's really what you think of when you think of Norwegian costume. And that is what the animators were going for with Anna's costume. Of course, Anna's costume isn't totally historical because again, made up kingdom. The main inaccuracies I see are really her boots and the color of that cape. So that's not totally accurate either. Now we're going to draw every layer of this dress. The first layer is the underwear. If Anna is wearing her own drawers from the coronation, we actually see a peak of them and they do have a little ruffled edge at the end. So that's pretty accurate. Next up, the stockings. For all the seasons, women wore stockings, so especially during the winter. But you see her climbing a mountain and it appears she's not wearing any stockings at all. When I saw that peak of leg, I was like, come on, you guys. Damn. And then the corset. I really doubt that Oaken had corsets in his shop, so I think we can assume that Anna was wearing her corset from earlier. Next, the petticoats. Petticoats were a product of modesty because they hid the woman's natural shape. Even seeing an ankle would be very scandalous in this time period. The next layer was the shirt. Shorta is Norwegian for shirt. These vary region by region, but for the most part, they were white and made of linen. This shirt is an actual shorta from the mid 19th century. And you can see that it has very full sleeves, unlike Anna's. And then we have the next layer. The bodice to the traditional Norwegian costume is called the leaf. The bodice was decorated with what is known as rusamalling embroidery. Anna's costume absolutely incorporates this type of embroidery, but the bodices varied from region to region and they came in many different colors. In this Norwegian genre painting from 1867, we do see a young girl wearing this type of bodice. And then a skirt. And this bodice would be worn with a skirt or skjorta in Norwegian. In this early 19th century costume study, we see how full these skirts could have gotten. So rusamoling embroidery came from the art of wood painting that was very popular in the 18th century and continued into the 19th century. You can see a variety of different skirts here that have this really elaborate floral embroidery. Anna's embroidery is really graphic and streamlined, and I'll give them credit, they put the right embroidery in the right place. It just isn't as elaborate as it would have been, probably because of the medium we're working in here. Next up, the apron. Most women in the countryside would wear an apron to complete the costume. In some regions, a special kind of bag was worn at the waist, and that was called the vesca. It would be fastened at the waistband and hang in the front. And it was a really visible part of the costume. So visible that often it was also embroidered. The next layer. This cape is a very bright magenta, which absolutely would not have happened in the 1840s. The discovery of this first synthetic dye in 1856 really created this color called mauvine, which is purplish fuchsia, this exact color. Even though the color is all wrong, this one detail that I'm really impressed by is the clasp at the neck. You can see it is super accurate. This clasp is a direct reference to the tradition of Norwegian silver making called solia. This specific example shows dangling spoons, which were once thought to reflect evil away from the wearer, including various forms of danger and trolls. And now the shoes. So let's take a close look at the shoes that she buys at Oaken's. The boots that Anna buys look to be a very shiny leather, 
but winter boots worn in Norway were typically made out of reindeer skin. Sorry, Sven. This type of shoe was worn by the Sami people for centuries. These shoes feature this curled toe, and they were originally designed that way so that you could hook your shoes into skis. I think with the addition of the heel, Anna's boots kind of look like Western cowboy boots. Finally, her hair and hat. Anna wears long braids, which you can see in many pictures of young Norwegian women, so it really is part of the culture. Each bunad had some form of headwear that completed the costume, and Anna has kind of a very small cap. So the shape of Anna's cap is really similar to this example from the 19th century, which really comes around the top of the head and has a point right down by the face. So here's what Anna would have looked like compared to the original Disney look. Overall, the animators of this film did a really great job incorporating these elements of traditional Norwegian clothing. The departures from historical accuracy are really to suit our modern sensibilities because this was a movie made for 21st century audiences. And what we want to see is characters that are accessible and attractive to the modern eye. And that's what Elsa and Anna would have worn if they lived in history.